Up next is a startup I personally love. A WP Engine, my company, when we have hundreds and hundreds of t-shirts that need to be folded and boxed for a conference, we lean on this startup. And when we have receipts that need to be scanned, um, things, uh, uh, data that needs to be entered, um, anything like that in the office, we call and use this startup. Personally, when I needed something urgently picked up from IKEA, I used this startup. And when my girlfriend, who's in the audience, needed to move out of her apartment, we used this startup. By the time that a startup is transcending between B2B and B2C, in many locations across America, there's something really interesting going on. The startup has an amazing story, and it's something which I'm sad that isn't yet here in, in Europe. But that startup is TaskRabbit, and I'm really delighted that founder and CEO um, Leah B uh, Baskey is joining us, along with Bloomberg edit anchor and editor-in-large Francine Lacroix to talk about their rise. Please welcome them on stage. Hello, everyone. So I'm a journalist, and I have a little bit of breaking news for you, because we were just listening to what Ben was saying. I'm a working full-time mother, and I thought, I wish TaskRabbit would be here in Europe. I wish it would come to London. And Leah told me just a couple of minutes ago that you're going to be launching internationally right here in London very soon. That's right. Uh, we're really, really excited to announce that London is going to be our first international city. Um, out of every city across the globe, it was the number one request we got from our user base to launch. And so by the end of the year, we will be live in London. Um, so folks can go to uh, taskrabbit.co.uk to hear about our launch news and our launch plans. Leah, just talk us through, when did you have this idea? It's very successful. You launched, and this is what surprised me the most, right in the middle of the financial crisis. This was 2008. Do yeah. you remember the moment where you said, I know what will make lives easier? You know, it's interesting. Um, so. Clearly, I didn't plan the timing well. Um, and it was just actually uh, kind of serendipitous that it ended up being the best time to launch a business like TaskRabbit. Um, at the time, I was a software engineer at IBM. I had worked there for the past seven years as a programmer. And I had this idea for TaskRabbit one night when my husband and I, we were sitting at home. We were getting ready to go out to dinner. And this was about February of 2008. We were living in Boston at the time, because I remember it was cold and snowy outside. And um, we called a cab to come pick us up and take us across town. And we realized we were out of dog food. And we had this 100-pound yellow lab named Kobe, who we kept very well fed. And that night, um, you know, the conversation turned into, wouldn't it be nice if there was just a place online we could go, say we needed dog food, name the price we're willing to pay. We're certain that there was someone in our own neighborhood that would be willing to help us out. And maybe even someone at the store at that very second. And it was just a matter of being able to connect with them. Um, and so even before the cab came to pick us up that night, uh, this idea for TaskRabbit was born. And I ended up quitting my job at IBM four months later to build the first version of the site, and then subsequently got it launched in the city of Boston by September of 08, which again was probably the, the lowest low um, as, as far as the financial crisis and the recession went. Um, and I just left my cushy job at IBM, and I was thinking, oh my god, what did I just do? I don't have a salary, I'm doing this startup, you know, was this really a good idea? But it turned out that I had so many people that were looking for work, that were unemployed or underemployed, were in between jobs, um, teachers and pharmacists and lawyers. And I was just um, really um, uh, pleasantly surprised by the variety and diversity of people that were really excited about this community we were building. And so it ended up being the best time to launch the company. Did you realize at the time that you were really one of the pioneers of the sharing economy? You know, I, when I had the idea, for me, I noticed three trends coming together. And this, again, February of 2008, uh, Facebook was just becoming really popular. It had broken out of the college scene. Uh, Twitter was just sort of up and coming. Uh, social uh, location-based platforms like Foursquare and Gowalla had just launched, but they didn't have a lot of traction yet. 
And the year prior is when the iPhone had come out. And so all of a sudden, everyone had these devices on them 24 seven where they were connecting with each other. And so as an engineer myself, I was, I was obsessed with these technologies, social, location, and mobile. And what, what was so compelling to me was there has to be a way to mash up these three technologies into something that connects people not only online, but also offline in the real world to get real things done. And that's what I was really excited about building. If you have questions for Leah, by the way, you, you can, if you just hashtag the web and then either send it to me at Flacqua or at LA Busky, do so because I'll keep five minutes at the end to, to oh, go great. through some of the Twitter questions. Yes. Leah, do you remember what was the most difficult time? So you set up this company, you had a, a, a great cushy job. Do you remember, was it funding that, that scared you in getting it? Was it the infrastructure? What is actually, you know, building this trust? Because mm -hmm. your business is built on trust. Mm -hmm. I have to trust the person to get the food for my dog or, or build my IKEA flat pack. Yeah, there were a lot of scary things. Um, and, you know, for me, I had left IBM. All I had really known was engineering. I didn't know how to build a company or how to be an entrepreneur or how to raise money and, and what that meant. And so there were a lot of unknowns I just had to figure out and overcome. And I had some great advisors along the way. Um, one, of, one of the main ones was Scott Griffith, who was the CEO of Zipcar um, at the time and working out of the Boston Cambridge area. He kind of took me under his wing and you know helped me get a lay of the landscape and understand how to fundraise and how to build a company, how to hire and build a team. Um, and so when I left IBM, uh, you know, my husband and I, we kind of, we looked at our finances and I had just, I cashed out my pension from IBM to fund the initial version of TaskRabbit and we kind of said, all right, we probably have about six months where you can go without a salary, without a job, and we can still, you know, pay for our house and pay for dog food and all these things, right? And so the September rolled around, the stock market crashed, it was the worst time to raise money. And the holidays rolled around, and this is now six months later. And I was getting really great traction with investors and with customers, but it still was a really tough time um, to get someone to write a check. And so it took about nine months, actually. And those last three months, between the six months and nine months, and it ended up being um, in the spring of 2009, when we actually closed our first round of angel investment from two Boston area um, investors. That was a really, really uh, scary three months. I mean, day to day, we were kind of like, should we keep doing this? Should we keep going? This, this could go on forever, and we, we really need to make a call. But we, uh, we made it happen. Yeah, and here you are five years later. And you just yeah. launched last week this, this B2B business. Mm -hmm. for I mean, TaskRabbit for B2B. Just tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, this was something really interesting that developed out of um, just watching our users in the community and understanding how they were using the service. And we started to see this trend where uh, small businesses were creating accounts as consumers, that was the only option at the time, but they were hiring task rabbits to come into their businesses and do things like office administration, receptionist work, um, help filing, whatever it was, data entry. And they, they were trying to get task rabbits to stay on instead of just a, a quick one-off task into more of a, a part-time job, temporary job. So we saw you know, uh, businesses posting, I need someone to come by for a week or two weeks or a month or you know, every Friday for the next six weeks. And so we just rolled out, we talked to all of those small businesses who were using TaskRabbit in that way and we just rolled out a new TaskRabbit for business experience. So finally an experience that's catered towards the small business customer and they're able to basically hire uh, the TaskRabbit network, the TaskRabbit community as an on-demand temporary labor force. Um, so if you think about the model of staffing industries yeah. or um, uh, like Manpower and, and Robert Half and Kelly Services, it's really taking that model and reinventing how businesses are connecting with temporary workers. And it's been really well received and really exciting to see. But again, it was something that came out of um, what users were doing on the platform organically. And, and this really is what fascinated me, is that not only could you get your, your tasks done by someone else, but you're actually employing people. Do you have any figures of how much the business can grow, how many people that can find temporary work thanks to TaskRabbit? Yeah, it's been exciting. You know, I think as uh, the, the vision has developed over time, we've really realized we're, we're poised to revolutionize 
the way people work and how they think about work. Um, and particularly, you know, in, a, in an economy where folks are in between jobs or they're underemployed, giving them the tools and resources and a platform to be their own bosses, be their own entrepreneurs, set their own schedules, say how much they get paid is incredibly exciting. And so we have some task rabbits that are, are cashing out up to 10,000 US dollars a month and doing this full time. Uh, they're picking up two to three jobs every single day. They're specializing in certain categories. And so being able to watch them build their businesses on the platform it is incredibly exciting to us. I guess the recession gave incentive to, you know, to various people to uh, work either for less or more or look at other opportunities. Do you think this will be the new normal, the way that a lot of people find work, continue to work in maybe temporary jobs, but at least with flexible hours? Yeah, it's, I think so. You know, uh, early on, I was having one of those sort of uh, a freak out moments when I had left IBM and uh, the recession had hit and, you know, we were, we were running out of personal money. And one of my advisors at the time, his name is Robbie, Robbie Vorhaus out of New York. He said, you know, Leah, the best ideas, the best companies are built out of tough times. And I realize now, looking back, that it's not really about TaskRabbit being able to emerge from the recession, but it's about all of these micro entrepreneurs emerging from this recession and really taking the reins um, of work into their own hands. And so that to me is the most exciting part of what we're doing. So you're opening in London, we hope, very soon. Yes. Great for me. What else, how much can you actually grow the business in four to five years from now? Yeah, so, you know, we get emails from people every day from all over the world. And I mentioned London is our number one requested city. Um, but, you know, we have the opportunity to disrupt the labor industry on a global scale based on the feedback we're receiving from people from all over the world. Um, places like Sydney, Australia, and Vancouver, um, Madrid, and Barcelona, and Rome, all of these are cities that we have waiting lists built up in already for TaskRabbit. And so, you know, we really are poised, I think, to do something um, that can impact people on a global scale. And, and do you have a budget? I don't know if you have a budget, for example, to open London. At the moment, you were showing me on the iPad, there's a, a special, you're basically doing a bit market research, but then you still yes. hope, and, uh, hope to open it by the end of the year. Yes, so yeah, at taskrabbit.co.uk, we're having folks sign up, but you know, my team is here this week on the ground, and we're looking to meet people that are interested in, interested in helping us um, launch London. They're interested in careers with TaskRabbit. Um, I've been meeting with all kinds kinds of uh, companies here in London, uh, startups um, that are giving us advice and, and tips uh, on how to get started here. And there's such exciting innovation happening right now in the city of London um, that just being here on the ground, I can feel that energy, um, which makes me even more excited to get here and, and be live in person. Um, now, Leah, in, in your journey up to here, how, you know, we talk a lot about regulation. We talk a lot about the fact that a lot of the sharing economy has to deal with, you know, tax problems, mm -hmm. regulation problems. What hurdles did you have to face and mm -hmm. how did you overcome them? Yeah, so with TaskRabbit, um, if you think about companies like Airbnb or Relay Rides, these are both examples of sharing econo economy companies that are taking high value assets that are underutilized. So people's homes or people's cars. And when you think about TaskRabbit, you know, I can make the argument that uh, the number one asset a person has is their free time and their special skills and their services. So being able to connect a community to share those things with each other um, is what we're all about. And so with that comes uh, innovation around how people connect and labor laws and taxes. And so we've overcome a lot of things. For instance, uh, we handle all of the, the taxes um, in the US. So 1099s and W2s, particularly with this new business product that we rolled out, we actually had to uh, build an infrastructure that was very 
very different from the consumer model in order to be able to, to service the small business customers. So, um, you know, another thing that we're looking at in the space is being able to provide uh, benefits and healthcare and group insurance for the TaskRabbit community. Um, so even though, you know, it's still, I think, the early days of uh, rethinking the labor markets and rethinking how people find work, uh, there's a lot of infrastructure there that we're going to need to continue to innovate on and kind of bring up to date as people evolve. Yeah, I want to get to some of the questions actually I had on Twitter because before we came, I already had a couple. So the first one is, what is the most important aspect of building a great team? It's a great question. Um, I think building the right team is probably one of the most important, if not the most important, um, thing that uh, a founder and a, a CEO, CEO can do for their startup. Um, and I had to learn a lot about hiring and recruiting and um, interviewing and how to find the right people. And I think for me, it really boils down to a couple of things. And that is finding people that are just as passionate as you are about your business. Um, particularly when you're talking about a smaller early stage startup, there's a lot of late nights, there's a lot of unknowns, there's a lot of intensity around what you're doing. And if you surround yourself with a team and people that um, really believe and are just as passionate as you are and are willing to really roll up their sleeves um, and put in the time and energy and thinking it's gonna take to be successful, I think that's the, that is the number one thing I look for in any, any candidate um, that we hire. Now I have another question. What advice would you give a startup where funds are a major stumbling block in, in getting off the ground? Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, and so, you know, I think that depends a lot on where you're located and what kind of startup it is and how, how much money you actually need um, to be capitalized and, and to get things off the ground. Um, you know, when I founded TaskRabbit in 2008 and into 2009, we raised a very small um, seed fund. Uh, it was, I think it was 150K in March of 2009. And it wasn't until the end of 2009 we actually raised a full seed, which was $1.8 million. Now, if you look at the time of when I left IBM to when we actually raised that full seed, that was about a year and a half of time that we bootstrapped the company, right? And it was me and a lot of contractors, maybe one other employee. Um, and so I think that being able to do as much as you can on a very scrappy, very creative, very tight budget is super important. And if you can get to the point where you can prove out your model, prove out the business, and when I say that, I think it's also important to focus in on proving just a couple key things. You don't have to boil the ocean, so to speak, right? If you just, if you look at your business and say like, if I can prove that I can acquire customers this way in this category and they will transact at this monetary value, like that might be enough then to go to an investor and say, look at what I've proven so far, here are my learnings. Also, by the way, here are my failures and here's what I learned from them. I think it's just important to have that story and to show a path um, of, of learning along the way. And as much as you can do on your own in a very bootstrapped way, I think the better. Now, this relates back, I, another question relates back to what we're talking a little bit about regulation. Can the peer economy grow based on trust and reputation without regulations? Um, I think it depends what category um, these peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces are in. You know, I think that, um, that the housing category, the transportation category, they're facing different things than we are at TaskRabbit. And so those categories can be very different. I think across all categories in peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces, trust and safety is the most important thing for us all to really crack the nut on. And we're gonna do that in different ways. For instance, at TaskRabbit, I got feedback very early on that it was important to people that we had a vetting process, that we background checked all of our task rabbits. And so we created a vetting process that includes a social security number trace, a federal criminal background check. Um, it includes a, a video interview that's um, live through the platform. And it includes actually a training program before, before they're activated on the site. So I think each company will find what it needs um, to build that trust and safety in the marketplace. I think the common denominator for all of us is really around reputation. 
um, around community ratings and reviews. And I think what's really interesting about the future of peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces and trust and safety is being able to aggregate reputation across these peer-to-peer -peer networks. So if I'm, you know, a fabulous task rabbit, um, you know, does that also mean that I'm a gracious host on Airbnb? And how can I show off my profile and my reputation across these different peer-to-peer -peer plays? And I think that's something we'll see start to develop over the next couple of years. That's very interesting. I hadn't thought about that. Um, we're kind of running out of time, but I want to get two in. The first one is what's the most amazing insight you've actually learned with how people use or actually become TaskRabbit? So early on when I launched the company in Boston, I thought, Boston's a great college town. I'm going to get all of these college students that want to sign up, that want to make extra money, that want to become TaskRabbits. And that was my first big learning because that was never the case. When I launched the community in Boston, um, as I said, you know, I had a lot of folks that were, had just been laid off. They were teachers, they were lawyers, they were pharmacists. They were stay-at-home moms that loved the idea of being able to make money while they were out running their own errands anyway. A lot of young professionals that were looking to supplement their incomes nights and weekends. And even to this day, we see about 25% of our TaskRabbit community who make up the retired population. So people that have had careers and life experiences but love the idea of staying active, of helping someone else in their neighborhood. So for me, that was a really early learning. That was an insight that I could not have guessed would happen myself, but it was something that definitely grew organically out of the community. And one last question. What are the major challenges you anticipate facing TaskRabbit as you roll out new cities such as London? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, even in the US, uh, we see differences market by market. So the market in New York is a little bit different than the market in San Francisco and LA in particular, which is very spread out. Um, and it, the culture there is very much around driving instead of public transportation. People interact differently. They get around differently. And so as we roll out to any new city, whether that's London or, or, or beyond, it's incredibly important um, to have local on the ground knowledge and to engage the local community in what we're building. Because when it comes down to it, we're really about neighbors connecting with other neighbors. And so you really need to have that at the core of your business. What happens after London? Do you have another city in mind? Well, we'll <laughs> see. I mean, uh, the community is telling us where to launch next. So if you have ideas, please, uh, please go to the site and vote up your favorite city across the globe. Leah, thank you so much. I enjoyed that. Thank Leah you. Leah Buskey there of TaskRabbit. Thank you.